Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. It's great to have all of you here with us this afternoon. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy and really excited about this very special event. Um, this event is uh, being led by one of the Ford School's um, very dynamic research centers, Close Up, which is the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. And so on behalf of Close Up and the Ford School, it's great to welcome all of you here. Um, it really is going to be a great conversation. I'd like to recognize a special member of the university communities. Um, Cynthia Wilbanks is with us, and she is the Vice President for Government Relations. Thanks for joining us. Great to have you here. Um, well, our panel for tonight represents a really distinguished group of experts. Judge Rhodes, Judge Rosen, Judge Godola, Senator Richardville, Representative Stallworth, and Mr. Jad Living, uh, Chad Livingood from the Detroit News. Uh, some of our guests are held up in traffic and will be joining us shortly, but we thought that we would just launch right in because there's a lot to talk about. And um, I know that you all have been eager to have us get started. So you'll find bios in the program. I'm not going to go into extensive detail, and I know that our host will speak in just a little bit more length about the critical roles that each of them played in the events that led up to the grand bargain. So for now, I will simply say that it really is a terrific honor to have each of you here with us and to be hosting you for this event. Welcome. So I suspect that there are no more than a handful of people in this state who could have picked up the phone and on very short notice um, put together such a really impressive group of experts. And so I'm really delighted to introduce the woman who did just that, someone with a very long track record of bringing people together, and that is our very own um, professor of practice, Gretchen Whitmer. We're delighted to have you here as part of our faculty. Gretchen is a former member of the Michigan Senate, representing the state's 23rd district from 2006 until 2014. In 2010, her colleagues choose, chose her to be the Senate Democratic leader, making her the first woman to lead a caucus in the Michigan Senate. She previously served in the Michigan House of Representatives and is an attorney specializing in regulatory and administrative litigation. And although she has not one but two degrees from a nearby Big Ten institution whose name will not be mentioned, <laughs> at least for a little while in these parts, I can say without a doubt, welcome, please join us. I can say without a doubt that we consider Gretchen to be a true champion for Michigan. That is very easy to say. <laughs> Um, so this fall, as I, uh, as I already alluded to, Gretchen joined the Ford School's faculty as a Towsley Foundation policymaker in residence. And a very generous gift from the Towsley Foundation has for 13 years helped us to enhance our curriculum and strengthen our ties to policy communities. Um, like Gretchen, all of our Towsley visitors have significant local, national, and or international policymaking experience as leaders. They teach courses, mentor students, work with faculty, and really become members of our community during their time with us. Um, Gretchen's course this semester is for undergraduates, and it's called Running, Serving, and Leading in a Legislative Body. The class gives students a practical understanding of what it takes to run for office, to serve as an office holder, and what leadership means amongst leaders. Um, in fact, today's event is really a special session of that class, giving all of you a glimpse into the engagement opportunities that she provides for our students. Thank you for all that you've done for our community, and again, we're delighted to have you as part of this event. So just a word about the format for today's event. Um, because it's part of a class, we're going to end around 6 p.m. instead of the usual 5.30 close. Um, Gretchen will introduce our panelists and then uh, launch the panel discussion. Each panelist will offer some remarks and then participate in the question and answer session that will be moderated by Gretchen. Then we'll have uh, an opportunity to take questions from the audience. So beginning at about 5 p.m., our staff will start collecting question cards. You should have received those as you came in. Uh, Close-ups program manager, Tom Abaco, together with two Ford School students, two uh, BA students, Connor Rubin and Elizabeth Oliva, will facilitate the question and answer session. And for those of you who are watching online, please tweet your questions to us and use the hashtag policy talks. With no further ado, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Gretchen Whitmer.
<clears throat> well, thank you. It is a privilege to be here, and it is a privilege to teach at the University of Michigan. And I tell all my Spartan friends and all my East Lansing neighbors how much I love University of Michigan. And I am proud to be affiliated with this university and, and certainly Dean Collins with the Ford School. Um, the quality of students, the caliber of the professionalism is just really an honor. So with that, we will jump right into the program. Um, when I put this class together, running, serving, and leading in a legislative body, Really, my personal goal was to try to inspire some of these young, brilliant minds to think about the chance maybe someday they'll run for office and be leaders. And so I'm looking at future leaders, and I've got a panel of amazing um, current leaders who really took our state through one of the toughest things we've ever faced as a state and did so in a, in a beautiful manner. And it's something that really um, was difficult and could have led to so many landmines along the way um, to navigate that with the leadership of Judge Rhodes and Judge Rosen, but also Mike Godola, who is now Judge Godola, but he was with the governor's office as legal counsel during the time of the grand bargain. Senator Richardville was the majority leader in the state senate, so he was my counterpart. Unfortunately, I was the minority leader. Um, <laughs> Chad Livengood, who is en route, but apparently there was some traffic in Brighton. Am I right, Judge Godola? That uh, yes. was the holdup? It took two hours to get here from Lansing. Well, I... I it wasn't even game day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, um, uh, and Representative Tommy Stallworth, who is a Detroiter Democrat from the House. And I thought that this was a really great opportunity to learn from the experts, talking about all of the different things that they had to confront when trying to solve this problem. Now, there are a lot of reasons that led to the problem, and I don't know that we're going to have a, any time to delve into that. And I don't know that everyone could agree on what all of those reasons were. But I think what everyone at this table can agree on is that Detroit had massive financial debt, and that it was, took a real act of courage on a governor's part a governor with whom I didn't always agree, but I admire the fact that it took a real act of courage to start this process. And I am grateful that I played a small role in this, but the role was actually played by, by Judge Rhodes and his leadership overseeing the whole thing. Now, as I think about how high the stakes were for so many people and all of the different interests that were involved, I was kind of going through, who, who did the city owe money to? Retirees, bondholders, creditors. What assets did it have? Well, we know it had the Detroit Institute of Arts and the um, amazing world-renowned art collection. Who else was a part of this solution that came to be? Was nonprofit foundations, retirees and pensioners, current employees of the, state, or of the city of Detroit? Think about the different players. We had emergency management and a newly elected mayor and all of the potential landmines that could have happened with that. And then the politics, right? The judiciary, the executive, and the legislative branches were all involved. Republicans and Democrats, metropolitan Detroiters and outstaters. We had state, county, and municipal levels of government as well as the public sector and the private foundation sector. This was an incredible thing that happened in Detroit. And with that introduction, I simply would like to start the beginning portion of this discussion. And Judge Rhodes has graciously agreed to start. I will jump in if, um, so to keep things moving if necessary. But with that, Judge Rhodes, thank you so much for joining us. And I'll turn it to you. Well, thank you, thank you for having me. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is really three things, uh, and, and briefly. The first is, what were, what were the city's debt obligations when it filed bankruptcy on July 18th, 2013? And then I want to talk about what the mood in the city was that I was faced with. And then I want to talk a, a little bit about um, how, how I reacted to the grand bargain itself. So the debts. Uh, there was $18 billion of debt that the city owed uh, when, it, when it filed bankruptcy. Uh, the largest uh, portion of that debt 
uh, was probably secure debt of the water department. Uh, but the second largest was probably what we came to call OPEB, Other Post-Employment Benefits, which consisted of the city's obligation to pay for the health care of its retirees. And that debt was calculated to be about $5 billion, $5 billion. And it was largely unfunded. Uh, the next largest debt was probably this, the debt that the city owed to its two pension plans, totaling about $3.5 billion, uh, although I came to learn later in the case that that obligation uh, could quite reasonably be calculated much, much higher than that. Um, the next uh, largest debt was probably the city's unsecured general obligation bond debt. Some of it was what we came to call Unlimited, you, uh, unlimited general obligation bonds, UT, unlimited tax general obligation bonds, and then limited tax uh, general obligation bonds. Uh, those added up to somewhere between 500 million and a uh, billion dollars. And then there were the general unsecured creditors, trade creditors, tort claim creditors, uh, and, and the like. Uh, so that was the, the financial lineup uh, when, uh, when the city uh, filed. Now, uh, of, of greatest concern to me when the city filed was actually not its debt. I, I assumed that one way or another that would get worked out through the bankruptcy process. That's what we do day in and day out in, in bankruptcy, and I was confident that the process would come to some kind of a result on the debt. What, what really concerned me was um, the anger of the people in the city. They were uh, extremely angry, and they were angry at really two distinct things. First, they were angry at the appointment of an emergency manager, because to many of them, that emergency manager um, had uh, unlawfully, improperly, even unconstitutionally displaced their duly elected government, and, and they didn't like that. They were angry, and they were protesting about that. And then. They also didn't like the fact that the city had been thrown into a bankruptcy case by this unelected um, emergency manager, and they were very upset about that. And so there were demonstrations uh, in, in the streets. Uh, and so throughout the case, it was my challenge as the judge overseeing uh, this process uh, to try to convince the skeptical and cynical and unhappy people in the city that that I was, I was going to be a fair and impartial arbiter of, of the law and the facts and, uh, and the procedure in the case. And, and I worked on that, that constantly throughout the case. Third, regarding the grand bargain, uh, as you'll hear, it was the first settlement uh, by creditors in the case. Um, I felt uh, a, a wonderful combination of gratitude and awe about it. Uh, gratitude, because I knew that it would make my job as the judge in the case easier, indeed much easier. Now, it wasn't going to make my job easy, but it was going to make it easier. Uh, and, and I was in awe at the accomplishment of it. It was, it was as, you'll, as you'll hear how it came to be, truly a miracle. Uh, it, it was unprecedented in the history of mediation, and it was unprecedented in the history of bankruptcy. It was unprecedented in the history of mediation because uh, mediators, the mediator's job is to resolve disputes between parties. But here, Judge Rosen and his team did much more than that. They went out, outside of their roles as mediators, and brought money to the table to help solve the problem. So, so that was unprecedented in, in mediation, and it's certainly unprecedented in bankruptcy for parties' problems to be solved uh, by gift money from, from the outside, from, from any source. That's, that's just un, unheard of. So I, I, I was overwhelmed with this sense of, of gratitude and, at awe, and awe at, at what um, Judge Rosen and the governor and the people in the legislature uh, and the foundations and the DIA itself were, were able to come together and do here to, to solve this problem. Thanks. First, Gretchen, thanks. Appreciate it. It's good, good to be have the gang back together again. <laughs> when Gretchen calls, uh, we all come. 
and uh, Dean, thank you for thank you for having us. Um, I thought I will I will pick up uh, where Steve left off and talk a little bit about the grand bargain. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into that a little later, uh, but uh, I want to start off by talking about the other side of the financial picture because. In addition to the crushing financial obligations that the city had, which, as Steve so well identified, there, there were human costs. Beneath the staggering $18 billion in total debt and the subparts that Steve talked about were the human costs of these debts. So I thought I would talk about it uh, just at the, at the outset. Detroit was what municipal bankruptcy experts call service delivery insolvent which is kind of a uh, antiseptic term, uh, which means that for the city's residents, businesses, visitors, uh, the city really isn't a city at all. Um, it's, it has no services that it is effectively delivering to the people who live in and come to the city. So I thought I would talk about some of those aspects. Um, basic public safety services, such as police, Firefighting and emergency medical services varied between uh, sporadic and non-existent. For example, response time for police was running at close to an hour. The national average is 11 minutes. Uh, there were 12,000 fires a year in Detroit. Many of them went unanswered. 40% um, of the city's 90,000 streetlights were out and the copper wire innards that would have been necessary to repair them had fallen victim to scavengers, all of which left the city's streets darkened, and of course, criminals thrived in the darkened streets. Uh, large areas of the sprawling 140 square mile city, which just to think about Detroit in terms of its geographic size, it's the size of Boston, San Francisco, and Manhattan combined. Uh, in, 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 in most areas of the city, garbage collection and snow removal, you know, basic city services that you need, uh, were haphazard and unreliable and often non-existent. Let's talk about the city's neighborhoods. The city's once vibrant neighborhoods that had once uh, housed almost two million people had decreased to fewer than 700,000 people, and these neighborhoods had 150,000 almost 150,000 uh, blighted homes and vacant lots, many of course and unfortunately now hosting uh, crack houses, prostitutes and squatters and other sort of criminal elements. Uh, the city's water and sewer system, the Detroit, once the vaunted Detroit water and sewer system, one of the sort of the best in the nation, uh, was springing leaks uh, and floods and it was collapsing with regularity and as Steve mentioned, the debt, the $6 billion bond debt for the DWSD gave little hope for infrastructure refinancing. Uh, I could go on and on and on about the state of the city. At the time of the bankruptcy filing, the city had less than, uh, the city had less than eight <coughs> weeks of operating cash. Um, Steve mentioned that the pension underfunding was at $3.5 billion. The city wasn't even making its contributions to the pensions. The city had stopped making its contribution to the pensions and the retirees who had given their working lives to the city. Uh, you know, th this debt had real human costs. And uh, I'm very happy that the governor recognized that because, and I don't mean this in any kind of partisan way because I put this on the governor's plural, that succeeded him, that preceded him rather over decades, had kicked the can down the road and applied, tried to apply band-aids or avoided the problem altogether. And nothing was getting better. Nothing was getting better. Detroit was devolving, continuing to lose population. Young people like yourselves were, stop, were leaving the city and not coming back. Uh, there was really no hope for the city. And this is how we found it. And for me, there was one other critical factor that I didn't realize when I first accepted the assignment from my friend Steve, which is a whole <laughs> different story. But I realized it as I started reading 
and read Kevin Orr's proposal for creditors, which was really uh, a history of the city's uh, financial and operational uh, decline. And in it, I found that there was really no assets to pay creditors. It, this was truly an assetless bankruptcy. And for me, that was devastating to find because my job was to get settlements with creditors between the city and the creditors. And to get settlements, you gotta have money or at least assets that you can convert to money. Indeed, the city had only one real readily liquidatable asset, which was its iconic art collection owned and housed by the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh, it was a world-renowned collection uh, of virtually every major and many, many sort of niche artists uh, in the world. And uh, every creditor wanted to monetize it and liquidate the museum for the, for the benefit of the creditors, which I thought would be devastating to not just the city, but the region and the state on virtually every level, level you could imagine. So when I first began thinking about how to, uh, the bankruptcy as a paradigm and how to approach settlement, it became obvious to me that the bankruptcy was sort of bookended by on the one hand the art and all of the cultural and uh, legal issues, there were a lot of legal issues surrounding it and the sort of the future leaning issues. What would Detroit look like what would Midtown look like, which was the fastest growing area of Detroit? What would Midtown look like if we liquidated the art museum? It drew 600,000 people, more than 600,000 people a year to Midtown. If we liquidated it, I thought it would be like dropping a bomb in the middle of Midtown. It would just, a hydrogen bomb would just suck the life out of Midtown. And even more than that, it would have created a civil war in the region because the folks who supported the DIA, which were the three counties that had just the year before voted a millage, they weren't gonna just stop and say, okay, fine, liquidate the art. Uh, the board of trustees of the DIA was literally a who's who of, 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 the, of the entire region of Detroit and they were raising a war chest to fight, to fight liquidation. So it would have sparked a war. So on the one hand of the book end, there was the art. On the other hand, were the retirees and their pensions. These are 23,000 people who had given their working lives, police officers, firefighters, emergency medical people, all the civilian employees who had given so much to the city and had promises made to them. Hey, Tommy, here's a hero. <laughs> Tommy likes to make an entrance. <laughs> <laughs> who had given so much to the city. And there were <clears throat> legal issues that surrounded this that would have taken years, maybe decades, to resolve to take up to the Supreme Court. And what would have been left of Detroit? Well, all of these many legal issues were resolved. Detroit would have continued to devolve. Population would have continued to decline. Revenues would have continued to decline. And the very first time Steve and I talked about this, the very first time we, we agreed on a lot of things, and one thing we agreed on, for sure, was time was the enemy. Nothing was going to get better with time. So not only did I have to try to get deals together, we had to do it quickly. We had to do it quickly. I could go on and on, but if no, I give a chance that's to everybody else. fantastic. So we've had the kind of perspective from the judiciary, and now we've got two legislators, but first we're gonna go to the executive branch because um, Mike worked with Governor Snyder at the time, and curious how the governor, um, how this, how this worked in the executive branch, I never, I never quite knew. <laughs> you were invited to the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Only when you needed my vote. <laughs> now, now, it never ends, does it? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I knew everything that went on, even though I was, I was uh, there and intimately involved uh, in this uh, rather miraculous process. I. Uh, was the governor's legal counsel uh, for four years. I am now privileged to be a me member of the Michigan Court of Appeals. Uh, I'm not the governor's lawyer any longer, but uh, I'm going to put in a brief for him uh, this afternoon with uh, all of you. Judge Rosen uh, frequently refers to 
uh, heroes of the bankruptcy, and I'm sitting among them. I'm not one of them, but uh, the yes, people to my right and my left are, and that includes Gretchen, who understated her uh, very key role in all of this as well. She belongs uh, on this panel with us, really. Um, but I think uh, Governor Rick Snyder has to be thought of as first among equals as far as heroes of the bankruptcy are concerned because, frankly, none of us would be sitting here in front of you today talking about this uh, if not for his laser focus on Detroit and its finances and uh, bringing the city uh, back to life. Um, Gretchen used the term courage, and I had that uh, very word here in my notes. Uh, it took incredible courage, I think, for the governor to do all the things he did really from 2011 moving forward. Um, the governor has a couple of uh, uh, phrases associated with him, uh, relentless positive action, one tough nerd, which was a campaign slogan from 2010. Um, it certainly took relentlessness and toughness. Um, to get this done uh, from the administration standpoint. And this does date back to 2011 with the passage of uh, then Public Act 4, which it was the first uh, ideation of uh, the revised emergency manager law. It was subjected to a referendum in 2012 and defeated at the polls. Um, the governor, undeterred, uh, spearheaded the passage of PA 436, which was a modified version of uh, the predecessor statute. And the members of the legislature uh, demonstrated great courage in the face of that uh, referendum vote in November in passing PA 436 in uh, December. Um, the governor, uh, during that time, declared a financial emergency in the city of Detroit. Um, he had the wisdom and very good fortune to identify um, Kevin Orr and convince him to take on uh, the Herculean task of being the emergency manager for the city of Detroit. He then authorized the city to file for bankruptcy in July of uh, 2013. Now, mind you, what this meant was the governor was um, putting, essentially putting, it was Kevin Orr who made the filing, but the governor was essentially putting the state's largest city into bankruptcy about 15 months before his reelection. So. Um, that was an act of tremendous political courage on his part. And then um, the two gentlemen sitting to my right, Judges Rosen and Rhodes, are huge heroes uh, in this process. Uh, the governor expressed uh, a desire to have this case concluded within one year, which was thought laughable at the time. Um, and certainly laughable by bankruptcy judges and bankruptcy lawyers that you could get uh, a case of this magnitude, and it was. It dwarfed any other municipal bankruptcy in the country at the time. Can I just yes. interject and put this in perspective? <clears throat> at the time Detroit filed bankruptcy, mm -hmm. every other municipality that was in bankruptcy was still in bankruptcy at the time we, Steve, confirmed the plan. Right. So this was really, we got through this in warp speed. Yeah, absolutely. And that is owing to their heroic efforts. Um, Judge Rosen in uh, miraculously coming up with uh, $350 million initially and $366 million worth of foundation funding in the end and then $100 million from the DIA funders um, to support the grand bargain. And Judge Rhodes in very calmly and deliberately uh, working this case through to conclusion in 15 months, which is absolutely uh, unbelievable. Um, and I will just say that Judge uh, Rhodes is the model of what you would want in a trial judge, uh, calm, deliberate, very smart. Um, same goes for Judge Rosen as well. So, um, so uh, I, I got to, uh, as part of this, um, watch my client, the governor, give a deposition and testify at an eligibility trial. These aren't things that you look forward to <laughs> as the governor's legal counsel. I, it's been said, and I think it's true, it's the first time a sitting governor has testified at a trial. We, we tried to prevent that from occurring, but Judge Rhodes wasn't very impressed with our arguments. <laughs> that is putting it mildly. <laughs> well, but you know, he, he turned out to be a pretty good witness. <laughs> yes, he was, I will concur. I was uh, proud of him as his, as his lawyer. Um, so that's sort of you know the macro view of the bankruptcy. He does case. have a Michigan law degree, Mike. Yes, he does, <laughs> <laughs> and he's very proud of it. 
Um, the grand bargain, uh, Judge Rhodes in his uh, confirmation opinion described it as the cornerstone of the city's plan of adjustment. And Judge Rosen, uh, as I mentioned, somehow managed to line up these foundation commitments and then challenge the governor, I'll put it that way, to match it. So $350 million, we need you now, state of Michigan, to come up with your own $350 million, and we'll get the DIA to kick in $100 million. And Mike was in that meeting. Yes, I was. And we couldn't quite believe that he'd managed to do it. And so, uh, in fact, I remember uh, one of the first meetings I attended in Judge Rosen's chambers in connection with the mediation. And this is before the grand bargain had developed. I think he, it was just sort of a kernel of a thought in his mind at the time. And It was a sketch on the cardboard backing of a legal pad. Yeah, he looked at me and said, you know, the state, Mike, the state's going to have to come to the table with some money to make this work. The state is just going to have to do this. And I looked at him and I said, Judge, I don't know if you've heard about this, but we have this thing in Lansing now called the Tea Party. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Senator Richardville can tell you a little bit more about that. I said, I don't see how we're going to be able to do this. But um, we accepted the challenge and then Senator Richardville, another hero of the bankruptcy, and Speaker Jace Bolger, um, they stepped up to the challenge, which was huge. And uh, the $350 million over 20 years became $194 million in a, in a lump sum, but we needed to get bills through the legislature uh, to make that happen. And uh, that leads me to you know an, another hero, uh, Tommy Stallworth, who is uh, to the senator's uh, left. And um, it required tremendous courage for Representative Stallworth to support this. Uh, as Judge Rhodes mentioned, neither the governor nor the emergency manager nor this plan nor anything associated with it were very popular in the city of Detroit. Uh, but Tommy um, really stepped up to the plate and he is, I think, in large part the reason we were able to get the main bill, the funding bill, passed through the House with over 100 votes. Um, and that is, uh, again, that is another thing that no one thought was remotely possible at the time we started all this. Um, Randy Richardville demonstrated great leadership in the Senate by getting a Republican caucus to support $194 million for the city of Detroit, which some wanted to paint as a bailout for the city. It wasn't that at all, but that's how it was portrayed by some. Uh, but he managed to, uh, once the bills made their way over to, across the rotunda to the Senate, uh, to uh, move them through uh, that chamber into the governor's desk, again, with the support of uh, Senator Whitmer and her uh, leadership on the Democratic side. So, uh, and a key component of that, I think, was the creation of a financial review commission, which was another bill in the package, uh, so that the city would have ongoing oversight of its finances, uh, which it has now and will have, I think, for some time into the future. And that was something that was very important on the, on the Republican side. So um, I'll stop talking there. I think we uh, eventually want to get to your questions, but I'll turn it over back to Gretchen. I'm, keep on rolling. Okay. Brandy, uh, maybe you can tell us you know, some, of the, some of the challenges from the legislative perspective, because I think we, well, you there were, were one things of them. that were I was, <laughs> <laughs> not on this issue. I was very good to work with on this issue. I'm going to defend Gretchen. She was great. <laughs> oh my goodness! At least when she was talking to me, she was terrific. Why do I ever give you a microphone? I don't know. I, I should have learned after all. I don't these know years. either. It's, you think you'd have learned by now? <laughs> Senator Whitmer and I actually go back uh, to our days in the House of Representatives, House, House of Representatives here in Michigan, and. Uh, although we're very opposite ends of the political spectrum, there comes a time, and this is the, of course, the Gerald Ford Center for Public Policy, so I'm going to be addressing you mostly. Um, there comes a time when you put the politics aside and you have to govern. And uh, Senator Whitmer and I, I think, are pretty good examples of that. Uh, we would get up and talk on the microphone about things that happened during the day that we vehemently disagreed upon. I was a lot more civil in my explanations <laughs> usually, but you know, people like the way she talked anyways and listened to her sometimes. But there were times when we would go uh, you know, away from everybody and all the cameras and say, what are we gonna do to get this done? And, and you have to understand, because I think Mike, uh, Judge Godola, I'm sorry, uh, said it right. The Tea Party took a lot of credit 
for the Republicans winning in 2010. I don't think they deserved all the credit that they took, but they became very loud during that time. And when the pendulum swung from the, from the left to the right, swung, I guess, from the left to the right, um, they took a lot of credit for it. And in a legislature like we have, where I had 26 Republicans, Senator Whitmer had 12 Democrats, in a state that you know, pretty much leans a little bit to the left, uh, those people that were in my room were listening to what the Tea Party said and were very, very adamant that we had to have smaller government, shrinking government. And we had just had the Kilpatrick administration leave Detroit. We had done some work with uh, the DIA in protecting that artwork. Uh, we had road taxes being talked about. We uh, just got done with Medicaid expansion as well. And I, I can't tell you how difficult it was to have the expansion of Medicaid vote, which when I got 11 of your 12, I think, to vote yeah, for. Yeah, I, I helped you on that one, too. You did. <laughs> yeah, so it was, well, that, but you had that one. I could never get 12, I could only get 11. That was actually the first thing you told me about the first time we met, was the scar tissue that was left from the Medicaid. <laughs> well, that, because it's very true. And now, you know, in order to get something passed in the Senate, you need 20 votes. I had 11, we got that done with nine, and it took me six months, including the governor taking out billboards against some of my members. We had the Republicans fighting so badly, which is why she was happy during that period of time. <laughs> uh, but we had just finished that. And it, it was very difficult. I mean, uh, Governor Snyder and I had to go privately into his office with the security people waiting outside to talk through that solution and how we're gonna get those votes done because he had come out quite adamantly that we needed to get this done. And he was over in Israel when we broke for the summer and he started a campaign called Take a Vote, Not a Vacation against my members who he was trying to get me to get votes for his program. So he flew back from Israel that day after he and I talked on the phone. I would have too with some of the things I said to him. Um, but we got back and we just got through that. Now the, he's coming to us. You know, he was challenged to come up with a couple hundred million dollars, but the governor's office doesn't appropriate, the legislature does. So after that, I've got to go back to my members and say, hey, by the way, even though we won with over a two to one majority and we got a lot of Tea Party kind of people in here and primaries and all that potentially you know, could come forward and run against you, we're now going to quote unquote bail out Detroit. And I was very adamant that it wasn't a bailout, that we had a whole lot of retirees that were going to be left without pensions. And that's what it was really about for me and for the legislature and those handful of people on the Republican side that voted for it. It really had to do about the face of those people that were not going to be able to retire with the promised pensions that they had. And it wasn't a bailout at all. In fact, what it was was just trying to keep the promise as best as we can. And by the way, my, my background's economics. I used to be a controller of Fortune 500 companies and things like that. The Attorney General had just recently before that said that the state was on the hook for that money if we couldn't come up with some kind of a deal. Now that doesn't mean that it's necessarily legally binding, but we're talking about three, $3 billion, something like that. It was a crazy number. I, I think I mentioned that to the governor, some of my conversations with him. I'm, I'm sure you did, I'm sure you did. But, so really for me, this was an investment. You invest $200 million into this, you're gonna get matching funds from the DIA and from other professionals out, uh, you know, other, um, philanthropy, you know, we had the, the whole group of people that were giving money. And so the whole thing falls apart if we don't put our share up. Plus, we're potentially on the hook for $3 billion. So for me, it was just a wise, conservative decision. And I got about 10 people to <laughs> agree with that. <laughs> and that's all that it took. But uh, Tommy, you, took, you had a lot of leadership over in the House. Why don't you tell a little bit about what happened there? Well, thanks, Randy. Yeah, let me um, just... Uh, initially, uh, thank the people that are on this, this panel uh, because uh, from my perspective, this deal doesn't happen without a true alignment of the stars. Um, you know, we, we, Judge Rosen was incredibly uh, creative in coming up with, these, with a plan that incentivized a fix uh, for Detroit. 
uh, Judge Rhodes uh, did a masterful job in managing the legal processes. But being a legislator, I can't even begin to tell you the number of people who, who helped move this thing forward. Um, the complexity uh, is just uh, unfathomable uh, to me. We talked about the Tea Party. Uh, but, you know, there were hundreds of stakeholders who daily were blowing up our phones, meeting in our offices, whether they were creditors, whether they were elected officials, whether they were retirees, uh, whether they were pension boards. Uh, you heard from a few union guys, too. Yeah, and certainly uh, <laughs> labor uh, played a, a key role. And um, so the challenge was really balancing all of those interests to get to the outcomes we wanted. Uh, first and for foremost, uh, in my mind, as, as uh, Senator Richardville uh, said, it was protecting the rights of, um, of, of retirees, those who had worked uh, all of their professional lives and retired on a promise that they would have a certain amount of income uh, to live off of and who were facing severe, severe cuts uh, to that income. Secondly, um, you know, getting the city of Detroit on a level, stabilized playing field where we could, we had a, uh, you know, we had a good shot, you know, at turning our city around and improving the quality of life for the families uh, that reside there. Uh, and then, of course, lastly, if we want a world-class uh, city, and Senator Richardville always uh, talked about that. Uh, you know, we needed to protect our cultural assets. And so, you know, this initiative, if you want to call it that, was one that I think was just, just tremendous. I hate John Walsh, uh, wasn't, isn't here tonight. I thought you said you hated John Walsh. <laughs> <laughs> it did sound like that's <laughs> a lot of good were, work. Those two were joined no, I, at the hip like know, brothers. <laughs> uh, but my point is, you know, we had strong leadership in the Senate. Uh, who, uh, who, were, who was able and committed to putting partisanship aside. Uh, we had strong leadership in the House uh, who were equally uh, committed, uh, but also important is the personalities. And so um, while we disagreed on many things, um, you were looking at personalities who, were, who, who could sit down and actually resolve those differences in, in a civil way, keeping the outcomes uh, that we all had agreed we wanted first uh, and foremost. Uh, when I talk about complexity, I can't even tell you how many amendments we entertained. I think at last count uh, in the House, we probably approved somewhere around 37. Um, and uh, if you can think about this just for a quick second, you know, when I uh, entered the legislature, I was told that uh, by my mom, who, by the way, served in the House for, for 25 years, she said. Uh, she was the best Stallworth we had. <laughs> I can't and, and disagree. there were three. <laughs> I can't disagree. Uh, but she said, you know, Tommy, you know, you're elected in a district, um, but you have an obligation to represent the interests of everyone in the state. Um, and to which I said, huh? <laughs> you know, how do you make this work? Uh, but it is really balancing the interests of all of the stakeholders, of all of the citizens that are trying to come up with solutions and answers um, that do no harm and, in fact, uh, improve the overall outcomes of those who live in, in our great state. Uh, my challenges were a little unique. I was running for state senate at the time. I thought I was doing a wonderful thing, although, you know, when we talk about the outcomes, uh, everybody wants to get well, but nobody wants to take the medicine. And so despite the wonderful outcomes that we achieved, you know, I still have people pointing their fingers at me that say, you're responsible for the cut to my pension, as small as it was. And quite frankly, police and fire didn't take any cut to their pensions. But, uh, you know, but, um, you know, there's still some pain. Now, with that being said, I'll just say this. Uh, this is only the beginning. 
Uh, right now in the legislature, we're facing uh, issues relative to the quality of education, public education in the city of Detroit. And that will be an equally complex challenge Absolutely. that's going to require the same level of commitment, uh, the same level of civility, the same level of teamwork and ability to resolve differences and seek compromise. Uh, and so as we think about the city of Detroit and, and public policy, uh, the moment in the grand bargain, what we accomplished there for me was a legacy moment. Uh, I left the legislature prematurely, but quite frankly, I can't think of uh, anything more important or more impactful that I could have done if I had stayed. And so I'm at peace where, with the time I served, and I'm hoping that we can drive the same level of outcomes relative to our public education system. If you'd have gotten the roads done, that would have been a pretty, pretty big thing. <laughs> well, they're working on it, I hear. Can I, can I interrupt just to say something real fast? A absolutely. That's so nice of you. <laughs> there is a friend of mine and of yours, Joe Schwartz, up in the back, who represented the University of Michigan when he was in the state senate, <laughs> as well as anyone before or since. He was also the president pro tem, and I think he deserves a round of applause for the work that he did. A lot of the students here are lucky enough to take courses with, Sen with Senator Congressman Dr. Schwarz. He's got a lot of titles and stuff. Uh, he, he deserves them all. Almost as many as some of these guys. So, I mean, that's great. And the, the legislative piece, I think, you know, was really helpful to understand kind of all of the different potential issues that we face as we tried to cobble the votes together. Um, and as I invited this wonderful panel to come and speak to my t class of 22, and everyone accepted. I asked the dean, maybe we should open this up for greater viewing and participation, and she said, absolutely. And then I took a call from Chad Livengood, and we were talking about Hillary Clinton's campaign, and I said, you covered the Detroit Grand Bargain, why don't you come on down too? And he graciously agreed to do that. Chad's been um, recently awarded a, a great honor with regard to the work that he's done in investigative reporting, and most recently, uh -oh. I think, covering this, the Gamrat Courser, interesting things that were going on at the Capitol. So not everyone wants to sit at a table with him, but I'm awfully glad that he's here in an era where we don't have a lot of people covering the Capitol and state policy the way that we used to. Um, it's really good to have someone who is as thorough and has integrity like Chad. So Chad, welcome, and please uh, feel free to, to tell us a few words of what your kind of perspective was. Perspective was. Well, I'm, I'm a political reporter in Lansing. I cover state government, uh, Governor Rick Snyder's administration, and the legislature, and just general politics. And a big part of my job, uh, and I've been on at the news since uh, early 2012, has been covering emergency managers and the Emergency Manager Act um, that, the, that the Snyder administration uh, implemented and then saw the voters repeal and then they uh, got re-implemented again um, almost 30 days later. Um, and, and I've been following, I followed you know, all the iterations of that and all the challenge, a lot of legal challenges. So when uh, Detroit got into consent agreement with the city to try to fix its finances in April of 2013, I started covering, 2012, excuse me, I started covering this a lot closer um, leading up to the appointment of an emergency manager in March of 2013. Um, I have never covered a bankruptcy before. Um, uh, never really spent a lot of time in federal court uh, until, I, until I spent about 60 days in Judge Rhodes' uh, uh, courtroom or in the media room watching uh, the uh, daily in and outs of the largest municipal bankruptcy in, in U.S. history. Um, my role was to sort of watch this from both the you know daily court role and also what the governor was doing because essentially the governor was kind of walking through the city of Detroit with his representatives through bankruptcy and and so early on I was I was learning a lot about just finances of the city I mean I I think this story if, if anything is just about a reckoning um, uh, of municipal government state government 
everybody had to kind of come to terms with what it was what what was in front of them and that was a lot of what Kevin Orr, the emergency manager's technique was, was to come in and lay bare the facts to people, think facts that, that Detroiters had ignored, facts that frankly the Grand Home Administration ignored, and, 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 and many others um, from Lansing to Detroit had just is simply not been paying attention uh, very closely to what was going on with this city. Uh, they, I mean, they, they, the, the numbers were staggering. They essentially were papering over their deficits every year for a decade. Uh, and in many cases, uh, the media ignored. I mean, I, when I started looking into um, uh, this big uh, interest rate swap deal uh, where the city of Detroit borrowed $1.4 billion of cash. 1.44, Jan. 1.44. <laughs> and they pumped it into their pension fund. So it's, a, it's the equivalent of you going out and borrowing money and putting it in your bank account and saying, I'm $1.44 billion richer all of a sudden, except you still owe it the money. Um, it, it was, it was mind-boggling um, uh, the way it was described in, in my own news outlet and, and, the, and the free press. So the free press editorial board called it uh, something similar to um, refinancing your mortgage, which was n nowhere near accurate. But um, this was a kind of a classic case to me of a city that had just been, um, you know, sort of mismanaged at several levels, uh, and 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 there was these high-level financial decisions made to try to get through um, the the cr the crisis of the day. And what Governor Snyder uh, seemingly and his and his team really went about doing was trying to untangle this this sort of web uh, that the city was was tied up into and. And so, so there, there was that mission, and then there was these two main, um, uh, the two P's, the paintings and the pensioners, and they were the the huge issues that, uh, from the outset, were going to be, you know, the the targets of this bankruptcy. It, it seemed like from the public view, and from the observer view. So we really focused on, you know. Uh, Focus on the law, the, the the personal effects of this, the people, how 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 this you know how this uh, bankruptcy could could you know restructure the city, make make you know basic services uh, that that a lot of us take for granted, uh, and I got a really gr I don't I don't live in Detroit, I live in Lansing, I grew up in Chelsea, I'm, I I mean I've spent a, a limited amount of time in my life really in Detroit, but most of my, my, most of my time in Detroit has been spent covering a bankruptcy basically. And I got a real, like a firsthand, uh, during the trial, I got a firsthand um, um, kind of experience with, uh, with the dysfunction of the city. Uh, and, and, and the judges would know this uh, from working on Lafayette Boulevard. Um, at 2nd and Lafayette, where the Detroit News and Free Press building, well, used to be until we moved last year, is right across the street from the headquarters for AFSME Council 25, the largest labor union in the city, <coughs> the two largest media organizations in the city, um, share basically the entire corner. Um, the street light was out there, was out for like a week and a half, uh, and it was the most annoying thing in the world. I couldn't understand why um, it, it, it was just out and people were just blowing through it. And I one time just walked into court, um, decided to take a photo, and I, and I was snapping some photos of cars blowing through it. And what do you know, a cop blew through it. Uh, he was turning left because the headquarters of the police department was like a block uh, to, to, the, to the north. And, and so even the cops were you know, ignoring it. And I thought, how is it that this busy intersection near on the outskirts of downtown can't get a light fix? What, what is it like in the neighborhoods of the city uh, to live here? And finally, one day, I, I finally, after that, I sent an email to my editors. I'm like, are we going to do something about this? This is our corner, by the way. You know, like, I thought it was kind of outrageous that um, the, 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 no, neither newspaper had written a story about it at this point. And so um, one of the editors asked Neil Rubin to go downstairs. That Neil Rubin's a, a features columnist of the news. And, and Neil was also outraged about it. So he got fired up and went downstairs to watch it. 
and he actually witnessed a car accident involving a pregnant woman. He wrote a column uh, for like a Tuesday newspaper, and by 10 o'clock a.m., Kevin Orr had uh, uh, someone out there from the, from, from the lighting department fixing that thing, because Bill Nowing, the, 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 his spokesman, saw it, and Kevin saw it in the morning paper, and, and, and they, they, they snapped right to it, but um, it, it, took like a, it took a newspaper column to fix a major um, uh, street light in, in downtown Detroit. Um, and, but it was really instructive to me. It was like right in the middle of this trial over just how uh, broken this city was. It was really instructive to me that something had to change. And everyone, and, and clearly this was kind of the, 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 the trial was the sort of laying the groundwork for uh, for the grand bargain that uh, eventually laid the groundwork for, the, for Judge Rhodes's decision about the, the that pensions could be impaired and, and reduced in, in bankruptcy court, but it, it really set the stage uh, for the need for all sides to to um, uh, give give some little bit, and, and some sides took major major cuts uh, compared to the pensioners. So, you know, I've, at this point, we would go to a few questions that I have, and then I've got a couple of great students who've got questions from the audience that they will pose, and we're being told to talk a little bit more directly into the microphones, so I'll try to lead by example. But um, as I think about some of the unique challenges, perhaps maybe Judge Rhodes, you could address the Attorney General played an interesting role, and you know it's the nature of the Attorney General's office, but I, I just think that that might be worth highlighting because I know it created some consternation, and um, I thought that might be kind of interesting for the students. Well, the, the, the major issue on which the Attorney General spoke in court was whether creditors in the case would have access to the art at the Detroit, at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh, it was technically owned by the city. It was a city uh, asset. Uh, but he, he took the position that it was not accessible to creditors in the bankruptcy process because, in his view, it was held in either what we call a charitable trust uh, or, or a public trust. Uh, and uh, he and, and his people wrote uh, a very powerful brief uh, outlining the history of the art uh, in the city and it was a, a, fast, uh, a fascinating historical review of, of, of the art uh, going back to the 1880s. Um, and I actually found it uh, to be very uh, informative and, and persuasive. Uh, and I'll just add here that um, I was fairly convinced from the beginning, and then my conviction was bolstered by this brief, uh, that the art was never really at play for creditors in the case. Um, and and I, was, I was ready at any moment to just go out into court and say that, to stop all the litigation about the art. But, but Judge Rosen, my mediator, kept saying, you can't do that, Steve. If, if you do that, you'll ruin my, my mediations. Let, let me <laughs> just have, well, have Judge Rosen explain why that was. Well, you know, the art was the only readily monetizable asset. Mm -hmm. And if we had told the DIA at the outset that it wasn't going to be monetized, that would have been game, set, match. We wouldn't have been able to monetize. It would have been the end of, you know, I would have had nothing to do. Uh, we wouldn't be here today. So we had to leave that loose. And by the way, I, I will say, Steve and I did not disagree about much in the bankruptcy, but we did have a slight disagreement about that. I was less impressed with the Attorney General's opinion uh, than Steve was. Uh, I thought there were a lot of holes in it. Uh, and I thought that the issue of whether it could be impaired in the bankruptcy uh, was a much closer issue. So uh, it was... Right, so, so, so now I have to speak in my defense. <laughs> <laughs> See how the, the legal, judiciary the legal, works over the there? The legal bankruptcy reason why I never thought it was at play was because creditors would not have access to the art outside of bankruptcy under any circumstances, and they admitted that because the remedies for creditors against municipal property are very limited under Michigan law. And I never was persuaded that creditors would have greater rights to property in bankruptcy than they had outside of bankruptcy. That's very counterintuitive. And, but there and, was another factor, which was that Steve, with all of the power and authority he had, could not 
override what the emergency manager was going to do the emergency manager was responsible for the city and i would remind everyone here that kevin had kevin or had indicated that everything was on the table including the art and he had gone out and had an appraisal done of the art by christie's uh, before the filing of the bankruptcy so even if steve had not wanted to approve it outside of the bankruptcy kevin could have liquidated the art for the benefit of creditors and uh, there's nothing that steve or i or anyone else could have done about that so the bankruptcy uh, you know sort of focused on the art but the art was very much the only tangible asset that i as the mediator had to, had available to monetize. So one of the things that I'm doing right now is reading Frank Kelly's book. He, um, he and Jack Lessonberry just wrote a book about his life. He is the longest serving attorney general of any state in the country. Um, and so I, I guess maybe one of the questions I had, and maybe this is for Mike Godola, um, the attorney generals, the nature of the office is to be the people's lawyer, and that's what people think of. They also represent the governor. They also represent the legislature. They defend lawsuits. They can jump in in any lawsuit that they think is impacting your rights. And so the attorney general um, was representing in a few different ways on this case. Is that accurate? And, and was yes. sometimes I wonder if that created <laughs> issues with the with the executive office. Yeah, it it did, and it does, and it did in this context and in others because, as uh, Gretchen points out. Um, you know, the, the attorney general is a separately elected officer, a constitutional officer in the state of Michigan. And, and so um, governors and attorneys general don't always agree on everything, including legal issues, even though uh, the attorney general is the governor's lawyer and that there is a tension there. And uh, the issue of the art is one of those upon which we disagree. I think we tended more towards Judge Rosen's view of that issue. I think Judge Rose may well be right with respect to the legal issue. He may or may not be. I think there's a very good case to be made, and he, he said so in his confirmation opinion. But I agree with Judge Rosen to the extent that it was very important to keep the art in play with respect to the overall resolution of the case. The other thing the attorney general did was to more or less take the side of the pensioners with respect to the ultimate legal issue mm -hmm of whether or not the state was obligated to uh, carry the city's um, obligations towards the pensioners p to pick those up. And uh, Senator Richardville was right. It was uh, a $3 billion obligation. Uh, I know that because it was in Judge Rhodes' opinion. And um, you know, if, if the attorney general was right on that issue, that would mean that we, the state of Michigan, were responsible for a $3 billion debt instead of having to bring $200 million uh, to the table, and on that issue, we we disagreed um, with uh, the attorney general. But uh, it was um, uh, one of those situations again where you know there's a tension, and you work through it, and we did work through it. Well, the the attorney general took the position that even in bankruptcy, the Michigan constitutional prohibition on the impairment of pensions. <clears throat> had to be, <clears throat> excuse me, had to be respected. Right. Um, and as much as I uh, appreciated the Attorney General's view on the art, I did disagree with this yes. one and hold that in bankruptcy pensions could be impaired because of the supremacy of federal law over state law. So I guess for the benefit of, of the students and, and the audience, um, what would the difference, I mean, we talk about this was such a great example of collaboration and negotiation and policy over politics and real courage. Um, some people did, though, pay a price, right? And, and, and we, I think it needs to be acknowledged, but how much greater would the pensioners, um, suffer, you know, cut have been had this process not played out the way that it So did? in Kevin Orr's uh, proposal for creditors, he was proposing uh, about 30 percent Be before bankruptcy before bankruptcy it could have been worse um, there were a lot of moving parts and different factors on the underfunding as Steve said Kevin pegged the underfunding at at three and a half billion it could have been much much more than that actually using more realistic numbers um, so uh, Kevin pegged the the cuts to the pensions at about 30 percent 
And if you think about this, you know, the pensions were not plush. Uh, the average pension for the general uh, retirement system, the civilian retirees, was about $19,000. And the average pension for the uniforms, uh, the police and firefighter uh, pension system, was uh, about $30,000, $31,000. Uh, but they didn't get Social Security, and many of them didn't get medic, weren't eligible for Medicare. Mm -hmm. So these would have been draconian cuts. And even more than that, and I think Mike and the governor's team were aware of the fact, and, and certainly the legislators were aware of the fact, that if cuts at this level were implemented, um, it would have thrown many of these folks on the social services programs, and the state would have had to have picked up a significant tab that way. So that's one of the reasons why I viewed the bankruptcy as bookended by the art and the pensions at the beginning. By the way, I, I, I should say, I, I don't know how many people know this. There's actually, I did a little sketch on the, on, right at the beginning of the bankruptcy, after Steve appointed me, I did a little sketch on the cardboard <coughs> backing of a uh, legal pad and that sketch it, which, of what became the grand bargain, and that is now hanging in the DIA. Um, my, <laughs> my grandmother, who, who, who was a very successful artist, would be shocked to know <laughs> that something that I drew is right. hanging in the DIA. It, it's in the section for abstract art. <laughs> it's very it's much. Original yeah. Rosen. <laughs> sketch is being generous, right? <laughs> it's more of a doodle. Yeah. It really is more of a doodle. <laughs> Well, at this point, I think maybe we'll go to a few questions from our audience, from the students who volunteered. I should put volunteer in quotes. <laughs> okay, um, my name is Elizabeth Oliva, and I'm a senior in the BA program studying health policy. I'm Connor Rubin. I'm a junior in the BA program, and I haven't been allowed to declare yet, so. <laughs> Okay, so our first question. Governor Snyder and the state legislature may, f uh, may, face some, may, may face a situation in which the largest school district in the state and the largest county get to the cusp of bankruptcy. What suggestions would you offer to solve the difficulties of the Detroit public schools and Wayne County flowing from their debt burdens? Thank you. Who wants to take who that? Wants to touch that? <laughs> well, I'm a judge well, now. Steve. So. <laughs> well, I, I think I, you know. I think one of the lessons of the Detroit bankruptcy case, which we have already t touched on, um, is that when a municipal entity, or really any, any entity for that matter, is insolvent or in a zone of insolvency, it doesn't do anyone any good to kick the can down the road. That has to stop. It has to stop. Uh, the, the phrase that we in bankruptcy use to deal with this issue is simply this. Denial is a river in Egypt. <laughs> okay? Denial, denial can play no part in the rational resolution of an insolvency. It just, it just can't. It has to be moved offshore. And I would add this, and it's a lesson that all of us learned in the bankruptcy. I call it the four C's, and it starts with Steve's denial as a river in Egypt. I call it candor. And the first step in addressing these kinds of structural problems and institutional problems is to face them candidly. You, you can't step away from them. And you have to face them candidly. You can't kick them down the road. So that's the first step. The next step, uh, which was demonstrated by Mike and his team, the governor, and, and uh, Randy and Gretchen and Tommy uh, is cooperation. You know, when there are these in seemingly intractable problems, it often starts, they often start with a lot of scar tissue. And we had to deal with that in the bankruptcy. And we had to remove the scar tissue. But once you remove the scar tissue and get folks to focus on what the real issues are and take out the history and the personalities and maybe the politics as much as you can, and you focus on what the real interests are that are at stake, paths to cooperation begin to open. So that's the second C. Uh, the third C, I would say, is courage. Um, and here you have represented up here uh, courage. People who 
were willing to not only confront the reality of the situation, but to overcome cynicism, rigidity, self-interest, political interest, step outside their comfort zone, their political comfort zone, and, and make really courageous decisions for the larger benefit. And uh, it took a lot of courage. It took courage for the 13 uh, philanthropies, the foundations, to, to go to their boards. I mean, this was really an out-of-the-box ask that I made of them. Uh, it took courage of the DIA to agree to, the, to our request to come up with $100 million. Um, so courage is the third C. And fourth, uh, creativity. Um, you know, you really do have to think outside the box. Uh, the grand bargain, I suppose, is maybe the, the best example of that in the bankruptcy. But everybody was being creative, and we did a lot of other deals in the bankruptcy that were very creative, very creative. So those are the four C's, and I think, you know, it's going to require that and other public policy issues such as the schools, uh, the roads. I'm not volunteering to be the mediator in any of them. <laughs> I was going to say perhaps Judge Rhodes could oversee yes. a Rhodes solution, but <laughs> go ahead, Senator Richerville, you wanted to? Well, the question was specifically about the governor and the legislature, I think, and how he would go about solving a problem like that. And I want to be real clear about this. In my years working with Rick Snyder, he's probably the best problem identifier I've ever worked with. He can find a problem no matter what. Now, he goes about solving it, <laughs> but he's relentless like and positive. It is a compliment <laughs> because finding these problems, like this Detroit bankruptcy didn't start last year. It started 30, 40 years ago, okay? And same with Detroit public schools, et cetera, et cetera. So this governor has stepped forward and said, here's a problem, and I'm not afraid to tackle it. And so the way this works sometimes is, you know, at the state of the state where he's the guy up in the front telling us what the agenda is gonna be for the next year. I'd be the guy sitting behind him to the right and the speaker would be the guy to the left. A lot of times I had no idea what he was gonna be talking about and then, you know, oh, this is what we're gonna do? Well, this isn't gonna be very easy to do. And so specifically, when you talk about what we're gonna do or what he would do there, is it, it we, we wouldn't have gotten this done and I don't know, I'm not, I don't think uh, sharing anything that I can't, but inside the caucus room, the primary concern was not just kicking the can down the road, but how do we make sure that this situation doesn't come back again? Because the votes that I couldn't get were like, this is the same, they, they showed me headlines from 1910, talking about Detroit and what problems Detroit had, and the 1930, the 1950, and it just kept coming back, coming back. So the oversight board was a big part of it. The legislature, even though it's term limited now, and they don't have the experience as people that came, from, that came before, they are people that say, we don't want these problems to come back again in the future. And I think that if you're going to have a solution to the Detroit public schools or to the roads or to anything else, you're going to have to have some oversight and responsibility and accountability um, before anything can move forward. Um, I would just add that, uh, well, as recently as this week, uh, the governor had a press conference relative to uh, his proposal for addressing uh, the, the uh, structural uh, deficit and debt associated with DPS. Um, and he's done that in collaboration with a, uh, a pretty diverse group of Detroit leaders who formed a coalition uh, for Detroit school children's future and offered recommendations uh, to address the systemic issues. Uh, the long and short of it, it is a restructuring of debt a restructuring of, of the district, this is what's proposed, um, that uh, along with the state kicking in money uh, to address the problem. Um, now, some might say it's a bailout, and I guess some are calling it a, a, a another bailout. And so we've got that negative messaging that, that has to be addressed. But some of the fundamental um, things that have to be addressed also is just like in the grand bargain, uh, we've got to make decisions on how we uh, protect collective bargaining rights uh, as we restructure the district. Uh, we've got to determine what level of oversight is necessary if, in fact, the state uh, and the legislature are willing to commit dollars to address uh, this debt. Um, we've got to have a conversation about uh, returning the school board 
to, to power. Uh, maybe power is too strong a term. I don't want to offend anybody. But, you know, we have a right to local control. And uh, over the last 15 years, we've been denied that. Uh, and so even in a restructuring, there is a question of who represents uh, residents' vote, uh, voices uh, in this process. Um, and so I think if we're effectively if we effectively address those things, we can uh, we can uh, can address the debt and put the district on on a level playing field. But I have to reiterate, just like I did re relative to the grand bargain, that's only the beginning. Dealing with the money is only the beginning. So just like we still have neighborhood quality of life issues that we are struggling with in the city of Detroit, none of what's been proposed relative to um, education. Uh, in Detroit addresses the need for true education reform. You know, how do we actually deliver quality education and ensure that uh, Detroit children are ready uh, and prepared for college and or uh, uh, are upwardly mobile, mo mobile and can expect uh, to be competitive in a global economy? I mean, those are the, that, that's got to be phase two, and unless we're having that conversation, just fixing the debt uh, really won't get at the, at the outcomes that, that we truly want. I think somewhat implicit in that question might be, can the grand bargain be replicated in some of these other situations? And I think, unfortunately, the answer to that question is no, because none of these other entities, certainly not the DPS or Wayne County, have an asset like the DIA at their disposal. It was valued at somewhere between 450 and $880 million and was the linchpin of the grand bargain in its absence, we wouldn't have had a grand bargain. So I don't think that uh, there's likely to be another grand bargain with respect to another uh, municipal uh, financial distress situation or a public schools distress situation. Uh, I don't know what the solution will be. I'm glad I'm not going to have to be a part of it. Uh, I do think Representative Stallworth is probably correct that at least with respect to DPS, um, the state may very well have to come to the table with some money yet again, because where else is it going to come from? I'd been covering this emerging financial problem with DPS for most of this year. Um, I did a kind of a deep dive earlier this year into the finances of the district. Um, because so I was looking through um, a certified annual financial report uh, known as a CAFR. Any of you who want to be in government are going to have to read these things. <laughs> so you might as well start now. Um, and, um, and I was reading through it, and I was looking at this chart of, um, of the enrollment. Uh, it, was, it was a whole bunch of different data about the number of teachers, paraprofessionals, janitors, librarians, um, administrators, and students. And 10 years ago, this school district had 150,000 kids. Today, they have less than 47,000. Um, but what jumped out at me was 10 years ago, they had, in 2004, they had 201 administrators. And in, in the 2014 school year, they had 203. And I said to myself, how in the hell did they possibly get two more administrators and 100,000 less children? Does that make any sense? And so I, I use this one number essentially as motivation to, write, to dive into the district's finances. And what I found was you have um, uh, a district that gets $15,000 per student, all, all, all funds, federal, state, local, and you have a district that is essentially at the bottom third of, of school systems in the state as far as a number of dollars going into the classroom. Um, you, ha you had just almost as much money going into administration that you had into direct uh, basic instruction. Um, I mean, just a couple hundred dollars more. Uh, I mean, where most the, most of these gaps were a couple thousand dollars. Um, so, so this is a I, I I kind of really agree with what Mike was saying there earlier. That this is a this is a totally different subject. You don't have thirty thousand pensioners who live in eighty three counties um, who vote. Okay, you have forty seven thousand school children in one contained city. Now, everyone. For politicians profess to all claim about all care about all children, but this is going to be a lot thornier of a, of a subject to try to navigate because 
it is, is, is contained in one district. And the governor's new price tag for um, rescuing uh, DPS, uh, not better than using bailout, uh, this is kind of post-auto bailout uh, terminology, rescuing DPS is $715 million over 10 years. That is double what the grand bargain was for the state's cost, which is 350 over 20 years, the way it sort of spreads out the equivalent, even though they paid 200 million up cash up front. But um, so it is a, it's a double the ask and it's, and it's a lot more complicated. There's governance issues, there's union, union issues, um, and, and um, there's a lot of issues involving adults, really. Um, but it's not, um, I, I agree that there's not going to be another grand bargain. There's going to have to be, um, there's probably going to be a cataclysmic event that sets the legislature off. It's some, they're gonna, they're, I, I, I have a lot of doubt uh, on this one that they're going to really tackle this issue. Um, the governor wants to get it done in, two, in the next two months because he knows that once, you, the, uh, once the calendar flips over to 2016, a lot of people get their mindset on elections. Um, but um, this, is a, this is a big issue. And the other thing that sets the, the Detroit bankruptcy and the program bargain apart from that issue, even in Wayne County as well, is uh, a lot more people had a, a lot of stake in Detroit um, than you do in the, the, the continued existence of Detroit public schools. Uh, thousands uh, of, of, of suburbanites compute, commute into the city every day. And, and so they're, they're, they were very supportive. And we had polling on the grand bargain uh, that showed like 70% support in, in Oakland County uh, for doing this because, uh, because people in the suburbs were just so tired of a city that didn't function that they were trying to, to work in or have a business in. Uh, or had moved and fled from essentially uh, over the last uh, 30, 40 years. So it's, it, there's a little bit, and, and also out state. Um, if any of you all are from, who all here was actually born in Detroit? I'm kind of curious. I do this survey every once in a while. Um, and who all of you, of you that were born in Detroit still live there or have a residency? Oh, one, two, three. Okay. I mean, you go out state and you just, you, you, it's amazing, especially people over 50, you can meet people just randomly who were born in Detroit. So there was a lot of sense of pride uh, with the city. I'm not sure that the, that that sense of pride with the school district is still there. And because they don't have any stake in it, like, um, because usually your, your, your pride in your school district is young people, young kids who want to make sure that their kid is getting the best education. So a lot, like I said, much thornier issue here. I'm gonna, I, you know, I'm gonna borrow the governor's term and say I guess I'm relentlessly uh, positive. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, and there are some mitigating factors that you didn't mention, Chad. Uh, and one is the fact that uh, over the last 15 years, uh, the conditions you've described have come under emergency managers. Uh, the state has actually been in charge of DPS. Uh, and so to the degree administration costs have increased, yeah. it is the state's responsibility. Uh, the other fact is that when the state initially uh, intervened, DPS had $80 million in the bank. Uh, we've gone from $80 million in the bank now to some, uh, to a $200, $300 million deficit. Um, you know, I, I think it's clear that the state is responsible for the financial straits at DPS, uh, up to and including uh, the les legislature's passage. And I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get into whether charter schools are good or bad, but we took the cap off of charter schools, which uh, helped drive the enrollment down in DPS. And now not only is DPS failing and, uh, and struggling financially, so are the charters. And so I don't think there's any real question about who's on the hook. Uh, it is the state, and uh, and look so look at me, I'm not there anymore. Well, we want you back, Randy. <laughs> uh, you know, and so and, and I and I, I just have to believe that with the right kind of approach, uh, we should be able to garner the support that's needed to correct the situation. Uh, well, I'm not I'm not a politician, so I don't know any about anything about all of that stuff. But I do know this. In what, order what for the city mean? of Detroit to <laughs> succeed, in order for the city of Detroit to succeed, its schools have to succeed because 
families won't move back into the city until the schools are succeeding. And Detroit needs families in order to succeed. Well, I'm not a lawyer, but it took a long time to answer that one question. <laughs> Governor Milliken would say in order for Michigan to succeed, Detroit has to succeed. To and, and you know, when, when you talk about I think Tommy alluded to the fact that when we're elected, we're elected by a district, but the Constitution says we represent all 10 million people. And if you go around the world, the whole world knows about the Detroit bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And while it was going on, I had people, I'd be in Israel or wherever I was, people come up and say, you're from Detroit? What's going on there? What's going on there? And in, unless the city of Detroit is the, is the state of Michigan around the world. So we all have to be vested in this. And so this, the next question, don't ask such a big question. All right, so yeah. with that, we're going to let Connor go ahead and ask the next one. So our second question is Connor, wait, where are you from? Oh, wait, you already did your introduction. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'll stop. So our second question is from Twitter, and this one's a little bit more pointed, uh, specifically to Judge Rhodes. If you were to write the playbook for the negotiating process, what would be on page one, and how do you begin? Um, uh, on page one, I recognize that in order for my bankruptcy case to succeed, the case has to be a settled case, not a litigated case, because none of the parties, and most especially Detroit, can afford to litigate for the years it was going to take to litigate all the issues in the case. So it was important to, to find the right mediator and, and uh, to lend all the support I, as the judge, could <clears throat> in, uh, in the mediation process. So uh, num the number one decision, of course, is who should the mediator be? Um, and it was clear to me from the start that Chief Judge Rosen was the right, right mediator. He had all the right combination of, of, of creativity, of connections, of thick skin, uh, of, uh, of, of political background and knowledge. And I also saw that from a constitutional perspective, if I can be a lawyer for just a second here, this is the state of Michigan coming to the federal government, to the federal courts, to solve a problem that it could not solve on its own under our constitutional structure. Because states can't impair debt. Only the federal courts can do that. So I thought it was entirely appropriate for the federal courts to bring to bear all of the resources they could to solve this problem. And so I thought it was appropriate for me uh, to ask Judge Rosen uh, to, to be the lead mediator in the case. OK, this question is for Judge Rosen. It seems compassion might also deserve a place amongst your C's. Would you agree? And to what extent has compassion grown or diminished among the bank, um, during the bankruptcy? Are you optimistic about the ability of Detroit to tackle its current problems given the players com and communities you interacted with during the hearings? That's a good suggestion. I'll add compassion. Um, I think compassion was probably uh, inherent in everything you've heard us say, starting with Steve, uh, certainly me, in thinking about the pensioners. Uh, and the, how badly they would be hurt, uh, but certainly compassion. But, you know, compassion doesn't get you to the finish line, uh, unfortunately. You have to have compassion, but you have to get to the finish line. Um, in terms of Detroit and its future, that's really what the question is. So that's a great question. And I'd like to just talk about it for two minutes, if I could, because we can't lose sight of how far we've come. Uh, we are almost at the one-year anniversary of Steve's confirmation of the plan of adjustment, almost at the one-year anniversary. So two seconds on where we were at the filing. I've already talked about service delivery and solvent. Steve talked about the numbers. But think about what people were saying about Detroit. Observers in the media around the nation, indeed around the world, were writing Detroit's obituary. If you go back and you read the papers from July of 2013, phrases like ruin porn and urban wasteland, complete with full color photographs, right, of, uh, of graffiti and uh, the ruins in Detroit were routinely used to describe Detroit. And it seemed that much of the world had written this great and historic city, uh, once the auto capital of the world and its arsenal of democracy, off for dead. That was where we were at the beginning. Less than 16 months later, when Steve confirmed the plan of adjustment, 
the plan of adjustment and the uh, associated uh, agreements, shed $7.3 billion in debt and restructured another, another $3.1 billion, provided $1.7 billion for blight removal, reinstatement of public safety services and revitalization of the city's infrastructure, including its streetlights, provided for only very, very small cuts to the pensions of its retirees and transitioned them to a more affordable and efficient health care plan. That's compassion. Provided for savings to the city's water and sewer system, uh, which itself was, is transitioning now to a regional system, a much needed regional system. Savings of $113 million for infrastructure repair and an income stream of $50 million a year for 40 years. It provided the city with a stable workforce through collective bargaining agreements with all of its unions, something that had not occurred in anybody's recent memory. It provided for real estate deals that will dramatically improve the city's tunnel to Windsor, its parking structures, its riverfront development, its convention center. And this is very important, people lose sight of that. At the filing of the bankruptcy, the city's bond rating was at junk status and falling. Now, the city has received an investment grade for its bond, which will save tens of millions of dollars in borrowing. And the plan of adjustment that Steve confirmed saved the DIA and its iconic treasured art collection and preserved them in perpetuity for future generations and posterity. A lot to accomplish in the bankruptcy. And the future of Detroit is great. And, and I'll just add that, that when we talk about compassion, and especially in the bankruptcy context, we have to talk about compassion for all of the stakeholders because when there is a bankruptcy, there has to be shared sacrifice by everybody. And we talk about the fact that the pensioners took a very small cut in their pension plan, in their pension payments. But the truth is they took an enormous hit on their health care benefits. Basically what they're left with is a little stipend to buy Obamacare. And so they're going to have the, the co-pays and the deductibles that they were not facing before. And, and as, as you may know, these can be big numbers out of a, out of a pension check that's $20,000 a year uh, and with a reduced COLA. So uh, there was shared sacrifice there, and we have to have compassion for that. And, you know, and, 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 and as much as this case was set up as you know, Main Street versus Wall Street, it, it, it never really was because in order for... Um, any of these parties to recover anything uh, of significance in the case, all had to sacrifice and all had to cooperate. And the creditors did. There, there was a, one class of creditors that took a 30% cut, another class of creditors took a 60% cut, and other creditors took a 90% cut on their claims in this bankruptcy, and, and the, total, the total give up, as, as Judge Rosen mentioned, was $7.3 billion. And, and you know, it's easy to say that you have, have to have compassion for the re retirees and their health care and their pensions, which I did. I, I, I really did. But, you know, the financial creditors took the biggest hits. These were folks who, I mean, these are people behind these. Th these aren't just soulless. These are investors, people. Maybe your pension funds have invested. Uh, the faculty here have invested. They took the biggest cuts and the toughest negotiations in the bankruptcy for me were with the financial creditors. The folks who loaned $1.44 billion on the, the so-called caps and swaps deal, they got 13%, 13%. And the pensions were able to keep that money, which is maybe the greatest miracle in the bankruptcy. They got 13.7%. A bunch of European banks really got hit hard. They got um, hit hard. You know, it, during the bankruptcy, I got calls from people, either with retiree, almost a lot of retirees, pensioners. Um, I the the city was at the time they were sort of trying to show the retirees early on what what life was going to be like after the bankruptcy. So they actually took away their um, platinum health insurance plan, uh, where the city was contributing seven to eight hundred dollars per month to a Blue Cross plan that was pretty darn good. Um, 
a lot better than you know journalists, maybe even better than legislators got. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and they were giving them a hundred and twenty-five dollar check, and there was all these problems. The city outsourced the the check writing to some company in Oregon, and then to get a ch to get that check to people, it took five six days in the mail. And I don't think someone at City Hall quite thought that through. And so I routinely dealt with several of these people that had that were looking for their check, um, and then I dealt with a, with a lady um, whose whose um, mother, ninety five year old mother was the widow of a firefighter who died in uh, a retired firefighter who died in 1985 which to date me was only I was three years old in that year and uh, and so she had been uh, on the city's plan for almost almost 30 years by herself after and her husband retired in the 70s um, and 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 so she was just sort of and she was um, mentally incapacitated and living with one of her daughters and this other daughter was trying to navigate this system, and I ended up calling Blue Cross on on, on her behalf and and trying to and and got and got got I called a vice president I knew and and he he got on the phone with and 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 got someone to call her and, and we got her through it, but it was it was a nightmare uh, and I spent like a better part of a Friday um, uh, doing this. <clears throat> then I got a call one day from a guy in cold water. Uh, Michigan, down uh, in the southern part of the state, and he um, he said he owned some limited bond, limited tax general obligation bonds, uh, which were just bonds that the city issued for um, uh, a variety of reasons. Most of them were capital improvements, and he wasn't sure whether he had um, he had insurance on these things because the 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 people that fought were not the bondholders; it was their insurers because their insurers, if they had insurance were on the hook for 100% of, of you know, wherever they lost, basically. They had to pay out. So if, if they, you know, got 13% uh, payout, they, um, they had to pay their, um, uh, they had to pay their customers 87% uh, of the cost. So, th um, so I, this guy knew what the series was, and I, I said, I think that's the uninsured ones. Because there's like, there was two or three series that were uninsured, mm -hmm. and it was kind of an odd mm -hmm. amount. And I looked it up, I went through all the, I mean, I spent like a good couple hours with that guy on the phone, um, and found mm -hmm. him, I found right in, deep in some, some city records, yes, he had the uninsured uh, series. And it was really kind of painful to tell, to tell the guy that, um, you're not going to get uh, made whole, um, and this is right after the the UTGO LTGO um, 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 deal where they got uh, twenty thirty seven percent thirty seven percent yeah cut. So, um, it, but it, not, it, not thirty seven percent. Excuse me, thirty seven percent. Yeah, thank you. Covered, um, yeah. So that was a really telling sort of moment that this wasn't just. Um, and this was just a guy who had who had invested in some bonds. Uh, I mean, people invest in muni bonds every day, and um, the muni bond industry is a multi-trillion-dollar deal. And a lot of people have a little piece of their nest egg in this. And this guy had a lot. He he wouldn't even tell me the number, but it was, he said it was it was uh, six figures. And so um, he 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 was pretty deep in in Detroit. Debt, and so um, um, it, it was a real, you know, eye-opening experience that the, there are some humans, even in our backyard, that are behind these, uh, you know, Wall Street. Basically. I want to spend one minute talking about the other side of the compassion coin. The other side of the compassion coin is responsibility. We took democracy away from the people of the city of Detroit. We contracted it. We didn't take it away entirely, but we contracted it very substantially. At the end of the bankruptcy case, we gave it back to them. Right? We put their mayor and their city council back in charge. Uh, but a big concern is what's going to happen when this present group of leaders, which is committed to carrying out and executing the plan, is replaced by the next group of elected leaders. I'm very concerned about that. So I, I, when I confirmed the plan, I told the people of the city of Detroit that democracy is not a spectator sport. They have a responsibility to them and to, to themselves and to their community to be sure that the leaders that they elect will make the responsible decisions and will execute the plan. Um, we, we are responsible for our leaders and for the decisions that they make. One lesson from Detroit, an important lesson, and not just Detroit, many, many municipalities around the country, is to continue to pile debt upon debt upon debt upon debt without restructuring the basic foundations of the city's institutional and structural financing is a road to oblivion. 
you know, Hollywood continues to make these fantastical movies about uh, tsunamis and tidal waves sweeping over cities. The real tidal wave that is sweeping over cities is debt. That is the real tidal wave. You can't make a movie about it, but that is the real, that is the real tidal wave. I mean, you could make a movie. I don't know if it'd yeah, sell it would sell very sell. well, but um, <laughs> I think we've got one range. more question and then we will wrap things up. This has been great. Go ahead, Connor. Yeah, so our final question is, governments have the ability to raise taxes to pay off debts. Why was this not pursued in this case, either at the municipal or state level? Because they max Steve, out the wanna, credit. Do you want to do that or you want me to? Um, the, well, well, th that was actually a factual issue in the case, and we had evidence from both sides on that. Um, the, the city, of course, took the position that it could not raise the taxes, either legally or, or practically, and the creditors thought that tax um, increases were uh, practical. Uh, but the overwhelming weight of the evidence supported the city's position. The city was already at its legal maximum tax rate. There was no room left under under our constitutional debt limits to, to borrow money. In fact, in this $1.44 billion cops and swaps transaction that Judge Rosen mentioned, uh, the city quite likely exceeded its constitutional debt limit. But more importantly than that, even if that could be raised somehow, um, the evidence uh, overwhelmingly established that merely raising the tax um, levy would not result in any actual increase in tax revenues, in fact, may well result in lower tax revenues, just because people would not want to pay those higher taxes and they would leave the city. As they had been for 50 yeah. years. One of the the story thing you have to understand about cities is that each city, Detroit and all of its suburbs, are in competition with each other for residents and for businesses. And residents and businesses look at the cost of remaining in the city uh, in comparison to the services they get compared to what they can get at the city next door or further out in the suburbs. And Detroit was in no position to compete uh, on that point where it was, let alone if it tried to raise taxes. One of the pre-bankruptcy stories we did at the Detroit News was looked at uh, property tax payments. And in 2012, year, um, the year before they um, got the uh, went into emergency management, they 47% of Detroit property owners did not pay their taxes. Um, I mean, this is an immense, huge um, non-payment mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons, whether it's uh, poverty um, or they didn't get the bill, bureaucratic problems. But a, the big, the big reason always stated was that it's not worth it for the you know, the crummy services I'm getting. Why should and and also just the cost? They'd have these tax bills that were equal to the equal or greater than the, what they could sell their house for. Right. Uh, a couple thousand dollars, uh, a two three thousand dollar tax bill for a house that would would fetch barely a thousand bucks basically, or on tax auction would bet, fetch like a couple hundred dollars. Um, so. This is a this was a, yeah the no win situation to try to raise taxes. Uh, there was nowhere to go. Detroit already had the highest tax rates in the state. Income tax rates uh, yeah. specifically. Income tax rates and property tax rates. Yeah. And as far as the state goes, I think it's overwhelmingly thought there that we have enough taxes in Michigan, and that we ought to be able to find the money within the money that we already bring in. So. So that's a hard note to, for me to end on because that's a debate I'd love to jump well, into. We haven't been able to solve but, the roads as you have. Right, well, right. no, no. But He's I, a big guy that I'm disagreeing with up there. So I think what you hear here is is how optimistic everyone feels that we've we are on a path, um, but that path is long and it requires fixing schools and it requires making sure water's safe and it requires pulling people out of poverty and. Um, there's a lot more work to do, and hopefully some of you are going to take those up, but hopefully they'll be fixed sooner than you're this age anyway. Um, <laughs> I want to thank the I U of M staff, the people at Close Up, the people from the dean's office. They did all the work. I got credit, but they did all the work here. My students, Elizabeth and Connor.
And I just I want to make sure everyone knows how lucky we are to have a panel of this caliber and this expertise. I really appreciate your making the effort to come to Ann Arbor to fight traffic, to fight through accidents on 96, and to, to still make it. And um, so I am just extremely grateful and ask that my you all join me extending your gratitude as well.